Yes, 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 yes. All right, so 6.3, we just got off of areas, and now we're finding volumes. Areas are two-dimensional regions, and volumes are three-dimensional regions, yes. Um, so the idea behind this section is how do you express a three-dimensional quantity as a two-dimensional integral, right? Because when we do integrals, we multiply. So we had like the height, which is one dimension, times dx, which is the other dimension. This is height times width, which gives us area. You add them all up from A to B, and you get area. So how do you get a three-dimensional quantity out of what appears to be a two-dimensional integral? Well, I'll show you how to do that. It relies on this idea right here. And this was kind of like a tax thing. When you were trying to find the volume of a geometric prism, all you had to do was find the area of the face which I think they called it the base on the formula chart, and they used big B, times the distance between the top face and the bottom face, which we'll call H. So here I have some geometric prisms. This is a rectangular prism. So if you wanted to find its volume, all you have to do is find the volume of the face, or the base, which I'll call that big A of X. It might vary. Let's just call it big A for now. It's the area. And then all you have to do is multiply by the height, which is the distance between the top face and the bottom face. All right, so again, the volume is going to be the area times H. But in this case, because the shape that is up here is a known shape, it's a rectangle, what is the area of a rectangle? If this is L and this is W, it's length times width, right? So we get length times width times height, which you almost just memorize without this formula. The area of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. But it's because... The cross-section, if you want to think of these as being stacked rectangles, if you were to take a slice right through the middle, right here, okay, you would get a cross-section that's a rectangle. And its area is length times width, and then all you do is multiply by the height between the top and the bottom. All right, so here's a triangular prism, and it's on its side. So it's a bunch of stacked triangles now. If you could figure out what the area of this is, the volume, is its area times H. Well, we know then that the area of a circle is one-half base times height. So if I call this the base and I call that the height, I'm going to use capital letters here. It'll be one-half base times height times the height, little h. So we have big H and little h. One's the height of the triangle, and one's the distance between the back triangle and the front. So it's just a triangular prism. But again, the area times the distance between the top and the uh, front, or the top and the bottom, front and back, that's the idea. Here's another triangular prism. I won't mess with that. Here's a circular prism, also known as a cylinder. Yeah. So if you want to find its volume, you just need to find the area of this cross section times the distance between that one and the bottom one. So same idea. The volume is area times height. But what is the area of a circle whose radius is, well, I'll use big R, pi r squared. So that's pi r squared times h. And now you have the volume formula for a cylinder, which you all have probably already memorized. But again, it's just a circular area times the distance between the top and bottom. So again, notice if you take a slice of the cylinder anywhere horizontally, that cross-section is going to be circular. So the circle is the first cross-sectional shape that is important to us. Because if I can come up with an area formula that might vary instead of a constant, times the, the thickness of each slice, h, which I'm going to call delta x. If I can then add those up from a to b, I can get an approximation for the volume. That's the idea behind it. If I can find an equation for the area of something that's irregular and multiply by the, the, the height between them, then I can add them up from left to right. And what do I mean? Well, let me motivate that formula. Let's say we have an artisan loaf of bread. It looks like that. What makes it artisan? It's made by craftsmen who have been making bread for thousands of years with secret recipes. And every loaf looks different because it's handcrafted with love. Okay? You want to find the volume of this artisan loaf of bread before you eat it. It's just paying respects to the artisan who made it. So there's two ways to find the volume. You can do it, A, by fluid displacement. Fill a bathtub full of water, measure the volume, take the loaf of bread, submerse it, see how much the water rose, and then subtract the two assuming the water doesn't infiltrate this, which it invariably will, right? But that's not a good method. 
It also ruins the loaf of bread, which is horrible. That's not paying any respect to the artisan. So what we're going to do is think about it this way. If I could slice the bread, which has an irregular top, if I could slice the bread in such a way that I can come up with an equation for the area of one of the faces of the slice, okay, then all I have to do to get the volume of that slice is multiplied by the thickness. The thickness here would be delta x, right? And then again, if I took that slice over here, it's going to be a smaller slice. That's why I need to come up with the formula for the area of the face as a variable function. But again, I can then multiply by delta x to get the volume of that slice. And if I took another slice over here, find the area of its face, so on and so forth, multiply by the thickness of the slice, I could then add up the volume of each of those slices and get an approximation for the volume of the loaf. That looks something like this. So it kind of has the feel of Riemann sums, but in 3D, yes? Instead of triangles, we have little toasts. This is like Texas slice, Texas toast, okay? But what happens if I add those up? I'm not getting the true volume of the loaf, right? So how can I minimize this step, graduated step error? Do what with the slices? Make them thinner, right? If you don't want that much error, just make your slices thinner and thinner and thinner. And pretty soon, they're so thin you can't measure them, the thickness goes from delta x to dx, which is infinitely thin. Not really good for a sandwich, but you can sure make a lot of them. And maybe that explains the parable of the loaves and fish. Maybe they were just sliced infinitely thin. Okay? Um, and, of course, once they're infinitely thin, how many slices can you fit in the loaf? Infinitely many. So this is where it turns to calculus. This is a finite approximation. If you take the limit as n, the number of those slices goes to infinity of the sum from a to b, from left to right, of all of these areas times delta x, or dx, yeah, delta x, then this turns into the volume, and it turns into the integral, the infinite sum. That's what sigma turns into. Sigma is a finite sum. The integral is an infinite sum from a to b of a of x times, and then delta x becomes dx. This is how we get volume out of a two-dimensional integral. Instead of integrating a height equation times the width, we're integrating an area equation times the width. And that's how we get 3D. So 2D times 1D equals three dimensions. All right, so our task is to try to find the area of a cross-section of any one of these. And that's why these geometric formulas are so important. In order to find the equation of the cross-section, it has to be a known geometric shape. So for this rectangular prism, slice it horizontally, the cross-sections are rectangles. Triangular prism, the cross-sections are triangles. We're going to focus on circles. If you slice this thing horizontally, the cross-sections are circular. And notice... The axis, if you were to like put this on a spool, an axis could run right down the middle like a toilet paper roll. This would be a vertical axis, and then you would slice it horizontally. If you slice it horizontal to that vertical axis, your cross sections are always going to be circular, right? It's like stacking a bunch of disks on a spool. All right, so let's, let me motivate the idea. That's what I just said up there. Let's motivate the idea. The formula for the volume of a sphere is four-thirds pi r cubed, right? We know that. We have that memorized. You ever wonder where that comes from? France, you might think, right? France. Yeah. You guess where it comes from? It comes from calculus, okay? So we are going to derive that formula using calculus. Pretty cool, right? And then, and then you're going to be using it in the future with more confidence. Yeah, now I know it's right. Yo, we derived that in calculus before I just took it on faith, okay? So here's what we're going to do. You ever slice a tomato for a hamburger, not for a salad? Right? I guess you could slice it for a salad. I guess you could slice it even for a hamburger. So when you slice a tomato, let's kind of motivate it way over here. You got a round tomato. I'll even use red. How about that? Here's a red tomato. Beautiful. It's a two-dimensional depiction of a red tomato. If you slice it this way, 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 and you're going to slice it kind of thick, right, maybe thin, if you looked at any one of those slices off to the side, they're going to look like this, right? And then, of course, they're going to have their veins in them like that, right? That's what it looks like, something like that. 
Anyone having a hard time visualizing tomato slices? Okay. If I could then look at the face of that slice, it's going to look like what shape? It's a circle, right? And depending on where you slice it, if you slice it towards the middle, the slice is going to be bigger. You're one of those unlucky people that gets that like heel end slice. It's going to be it's going to be a tiny, kind of a small slice, right? And they're like, it's okay. I'm going to give you like three of them instead. We'll space them out on the burger, okay? So notice that the circle's size vary. But here's the idea behind it. If I could figure out the volume of one of those slices, I can then add all of them up from left to right. So what's needed? Well, this I'm going to call the radius of the slice, big R. It's the radius of the slice. And so what's, what would be the area of the face? It would be pi times big R of X squared. Would you agree? Now, I don't know what the equation is for big R, but I do know it varies. And then all I would have to do then, if this thickness, I'm going to go ahead and just call the thickness dx instead of delta x. The volume then of that slice is going to be pi times r squared times dx. That's what we just did. Pi r squared, the area of the face, times the width. This is area, and this is width. So that gives you your three dimensions. And then all I have to do to find the total volume since that's one slice, is add them all up from left to right, from A to B, of pi r squared dx. That should give it to me. That's my template. Pi r squared is the area of the face. Multiplied by dx, that gives you one slice, and then the integral adds them all up from left to right. So kind of like the artisan bread. All right, so that's my template. Let's go ahead and see how we could do that. Let's draw a semicircle, because here's how we're going to be doing these problems in this section. A semicircle with a radius of r is going to have an ordered pair right there, r0. All right, so little r0, that's going to be 0, little r, and this will be negative r0. So let's go ahead and say let little r equal the radius of a semicircle. Or eventually it's going to be the radius of our tomato. Okay? We're going to treat it like a constant. Are you okay with that? Treat it like a constant. You can't slice a tomato unless you got a tomato, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's say we have a tomato of a certain size. Try it. Go home and try to slice a tomato without tomato. Like, I've got a potato. Not the same. All right, so now we're going to take this semicircular region, and we are going to generate a three-dimensional solid that is a sphere by rotating that around an axis of rotation. And I'm going to rotate it around the x-axis. We're taking a two-dimensional region, and notice this little swirly, loopy thing around the x-axis simulates we're going to take it for a 360 spin around the x-axis. Now, what would that look like? I have something here that kind of symbolizes that. It's not perfectly circular. It has some kind of curve. But if I butt that up against the x-axis, and I rotate it around 360, there's 180, rotate it around the rest of the way, you end up with a three-dimensional solid. See that? Now it's three-dimensional. Since I rotated around the x-axis, if I were to slice this thing vertically, which is perpendicular to the horizontal axis, if I were to slice this vertically and gave each of you a slice, if you face the slice head on, what shape would you see? Circles, right? If I slice this thing like horizontally, everyone's going to get some weird shape. But if I slice this thing vertically from left to right, everybody's going to have a little disc on their, on their plate, right? A little disc, a little circular thing. That has a certain thickness. So that's how we're going to generate these volumes in this section. We're going to take a region, like a two-dimensional area, like in this previous section, and we're going to rotate it around an axis of rotation, or revolution as it's sometimes called. And that's going to generate the three-dimensional thing. So now, if I slice this from left to right, here would be a small slice. Here would be a bigger slice. If I look at that slice off to the side, here's what it's going to look like. The axis runs right through the middle. Here's my radius, which I'm going to call big R. I'm going to let big R equal the slice of the tomato. Well, little r is the radius of the tomato. It's a constant. But notice, if I slice, if I slice towards the center of the tomato, that slice is going to be a lot bigger. Right? Yeah, so here would be the radius big R 
And if you slice towards the end, that, that's kind of what I was talking about in the, in the beginning. You, you get the heel. So let big R be the variable. It's the variable slice of the tomato, whereas little r is the constant now radius of the, of the entire tomato, not the slice of the tomato. So now let's go ahead and set it up. To find the volume, V, all I got to do is add up the sum of the infinitely many slices from left to right, which is from negative r to r, of pi times the radius squared with respect to x. Well, here's what it comes down to. Can I write the equation for this variable radius of the slice? Okay, and you could draw several different examples of it right there. There's another one. It does vary. Okay, it's zero at the end and it's little r at the at the biggest. Well, it's the same thing that we did in the previous section. Okay, in the previous section we called this the height of the curve. It's the exact same thing. We're just now calling it a radius. It's a radius of rotation. Well, that's going to be easy. It's going to be top minus bottom. So now it comes down to okay. I know the bottom is zero. How can I find an equation in terms of little r for the curve? Well, that's just the equation of a semicircle. So let's kind of come over here. The equation of a full circle centered at the origin is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. If you solve that for y squared, you get little r squared minus x squared. Now, when you take the square root, remember, you consider plus or minus. I'm going to take the positive version because that gives me the top semicircle. If you take the negative version, you get this dotted line one that I have down there. I don't want that one. Either one would work. They ultimately, if you rotate it 360, give you a full sphere. So I'm just going to work with the top one. Yeah, that's the equation of the semicircle. That's going to be this curve right here, okay, with a radius of little r. So that ends up being the top curve. So here's, here's our radius. The radius is, again, top minus bottom. The curve that's on top is the square root of r squared minus x squared. And on the bottom, we have 0. Now, that's exactly what we called h of x in the previous section. We're now just calling it what? r of x. And the only difference is h of x is going to be curve minus curve. But for a radius, it's still top minus bottom. But now you don't have a radius unless you have an axis. So it's going to be curve minus axis in this case. One of them has to be the axis, right? The curve is on top, and the axis of rotation was the bottom. Okay, so these radii, they come off of the axis like that. All right, so now I have something that I can work with. Let's simplify the integral. I'm going to pull the pi out front because it's a constant multiple, and that's from negative r to r. And then radical minus zero is radical. Radical squared is radicand. So that's just r squared minus x squared dx. So that's simplifying the radicand, or the integrand, sorry. And now I can use symmetry. Negative r to r would work, but because this is perfectly symmetrical, what if I went from zero to r and I slice this tomato on half the interval, just double it? So that would be advantageous to me. So I'm going to go 2 pi, but from zero to r of r squared minus x squared. And this is good when you have symmetry and you have to do it by hand. I just didn't want to have to deal with negative r. And because it had y-axis symmetry, if you find the volume of half the tomato by slicing it from 0 to r, okay, then you just double it to get the second half. It's an option. That was not a requirement. OK, so now this is the important part. This is the setup. This is the setup. And all we have to do is now evaluate that. So at this point, it should be routine. And I'll let you do the calculations with me. So I'm going to keep v for volume on this side. 2 pi goes along for the ride. Let's integrate where we're integrating with respect to x. So remember, little r is a constant. So little r squared is a constant. So what would the antiderivative of little r squared be with respect to x? If it were 5, what would the antiderivative of 5 be? 5x. Five so it's r squared x, right? If it's a constant, you just add an x. Minus x squared is one-third x cubed. And then we evaluate it from 0 to r. So, so good so far? 
We're inventing calculus formulas. All right, and we're treating little r like a constant. We have a tomato to slice. So now it's just a matter of evaluating. Plug in the top, so every x becomes an r. So when I plug in my r for x, I get r squared times r, which is r cubed, minus one-third r cubed. That's plugging in the top. Minus plugging in the bottom, you get zero minus zero, which is zero. And so we're almost there. What is one r cubed minus a third r cubed? One minus a third is two-thirds, right? Three-thirds minus one-third is two-thirds. Take away a third, we're left with two-thirds. So, so, so this becomes this. And now I just combine my like factors. Two pi times two-thirds is four-thirds pi r cubed. And because I let little r, I treated it as a constant all the way through, that was great, but now it truly is a variable. So now we can let little r be who he was meant to be. We can let him be a variable again. And so now we can let this be the formula for the volume of any cylinder whose radius is r, not just the one we had, because we used it as a variable but treated it like a constant. And that's where the formula for the volume of a sphere comes from. Is Yes, this is a, well, not prove this, but the idea of what we're going to be doing here is a very common free response thing. They'll have you find the area of the region first, typically, and then they'll have, they'll say, take that for a spin around an axis and find the volume. Now, you're not going to have to, like, invent anything from scratch like we did here, all right? But the idea of this is important. Because we rotated it, and here's the important thing, because we rotated it around a horizontal axis, well, let me use a different color here. Because we rotated it around a horizontal axis, in order to get circular cross sections, you have to slice perpendicular to that. Okay? And for a circle, it's not that important because it has rotational symmetry. But if you think about my example here, if I rotate it around that x-axis and I started slicing this thing horizontally, your cross sections aren't going to be circles. But because the axis was horizontal, if I slice it vertically, now all of your cross sections, your our little disks, they're going to be circles, okay? So this method is called the disk method because you're finding the volume of tiny little disks that look like this. You have an axis of rotation. You have a radius of rotation called big R of X. And if you take that thing for a spin, what it looks like is something like this. It looks like that. And it has a thickness of DX. And if you could find the volume of one of those disks, which, of course, we know, uh, is the area of the face, pi r of x squared, and then you multiply by dx, the width, to get the volume, then you add it up from left to right, from a to b, and you get yourself a volume formula. It's called the disk method. Okay, so here's the, here's the formula. We bring the pi out front typically because it's a constant, but it's the sum of the infinitely thin slices from a to b, and it's r squared. I don't like writing r squared like that. Your calculator likes that. I prefer writing the square in there, so that's what I'm going to do. R squared, and then times the width dx. So really, here's all it is. The disk method is pi r squared, which is the area of a circle, times the width dx. Don't forget that. The disk method, as this is going to be called, is pi r squared, the circular face, times dx, the thickness of the disk, which is very thin. It's thinner than a dime or a quarter. Okay, It's very thin. It's infinitely thin, which is why we add them up infinitely from left to right. So we're not going to have to do any, like, approximations with this like we did with Riemann sums. We're just going to go straight to the actual formula. Okay, so let's look at a typical question that you might be asked in the same wording that they're going to be using. Find the volume of the solid. Okay, so that's three dimensions. Form by rotating. Sometimes they say revolving. It's the same thing. These are called volumes of solids of rotation, or volumes of solids of revolution, which sounds more like maybe some kind of gunfight or bayonet fight. The region is bounded by, okay, so just like in the previous section, you're going to be given enough curves to identify a region because you're not going to take anything for a spin until you have something to take for a spin. So they're giving you, in this case, three, three things, the x-axis, the equation y equals square root of x, and the vertical line x equals 1. That's going to define a region, and then we're going to take it for a spin around the x-axis. Sometimes it says about the x-axis. It's really the same thing, Okay. So step one for any of these volumes of solids of rotation is to, like we did in the previous section, identify the region. So I'll go ahead and do that. 
x and y axis. Okay, so the x axis, that's there. The square root of x looks like this. And then x equals 1, I'm just going to say it's right here. It's a vertical line. Don't draw it too close to the y-axis, and it makes it hard to visualize. But here's the region right here. So let's go ahead and review the previous section, because this makes a wonderful pre-response. Part A would say to find the area. So for us, let's slice it vertically, yeah? Vertically, there's your thickness dx, and we're trying to write the equation for that, h of x. Well, it's just top minus bottom, so I'm going to get rid of that. It's going to be then the sum of the infinitely thin slices from left to right, which is from 0 to 1, of the height, which is top minus bottom, times the thickness, dx. Well, the curve on top is the square root of x. The curve on the bottom is 0. So that would be your setup for the area. And, of course, you could evaluate that pretty darn easily. I'm going to put that off to the side. That's not really what we're interested in today. But that, that would be pretty easy, okay? Integrate it, plug it in, you got your area. We're going to take this for a spin now on part B is typically where this occurs after you've done the area. Take it for a spin around the x-axis. Now, the next part is not required, but it's sometimes fun. What does the three-dimensional shape look like? Not a requirement, but it can be fun. So here's how you would do it. Just reflect it across the axis of rotation and extend the line down and then give it that old three-dimensional look by drawing it look like that. And so this is going to be a three-dimensional solid that ends up looking, bless you, like half of a boiled egg. You see that? It's going to look like half of a boiled egg. Yum. A purple boiled egg. Just, just like at Easter. Unless it's already peeled and it's purple. Hmm. Okay. So in order to get cross-sections that are disks, because the axis of rotation was horizontal, we have to slice it perpendicular to that. So if I take a slice all the way through this half of an egg, it's going to look have a thickness of dx, and off to the side, it's going to look like this. Okay? There's the thickness dx. So the idea is if I could find the area of the face, which is circular, all i got to do is multiply it by dx. So this is what I'm going to call r of x, and it's nothing more than the radius. It's this right here. If I can find that equation, then I've got it made because it's just pi r squared dx. Well, I think we could find that. It's top minus bottom. So let's go straight to the equation. V for volume is fine because we don't ever store anything as V. You don't want to say A for area. So it's pi. Don't forget pi comes up front. The integral from left to right. So that's still from 0 to 1. From 0 to 1 of r squared dx. So this is how I typically set it up. It's a two-step process. Pi r squared dx, and I leave a template for r. And then I come back for my r, and I do top minus bottom. Now remember, one of those has to be the axis. So if you look at it, it's pretty easy. The curve that's on top from left to right is always the square root of x, and the bottom is the axis of rotation. Okay, So that's going to be the square root of x minus 0. And if you notice, it's exactly the same for the radius and the height. That's not always going to be the case, but right now it is. The only difference is to get a volume, we're making this an area by squaring it and putting the pi out front. Okay? So that would be your setup. And on an AP exam, if this were part B, you've already got two checks, one for your integrand and one for this part right here. So let's go ahead and finish it as if it was a non-calculator. Once you get to the setup, I'm going to assume after today, that you're going to be able to integrate it. We're not going to practice the integration every time because that's something that you all should know. But this one simplifies really nicely. Square root of x minus 0 is square root of x. That squared is just x. So to integrate it, we get pi times 1 half x squared from 0 to 1. So that's b equals. I'm going to pull the 1 half out front and call it pi halves. And then I plug in the top, 1 squared minus 0 squared. And we end up with the volume equaling pi halves. And that would be units cubed, whatever they are. You're not going to typically have units. But now we know the volume of that half of an egg is pi halves cubic units. Sweet. I hope it's cubic feet because I like half an egg. And that's a lot of egg if it's cubic feet. Ugh, gross. Egg salad for weeks. Cubic foot. Maybe cubic inches would be better. 
Okay. Um, comments or questions on that? Okay, so here's the deal. You are not going to get disc cross-sections if you do not slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation. It's not going to happen. So to help you remember that, the word of the day is perpendicular. See what I did there? Perpendicular. Whenever your slices are perpendicular to the axis of rotation, your cross-sections are going to be disks. And there you go. Helps you remember. Perpendicular. And a disk is just pi r squared times dx. They're tiny little cylinders. That's all they are with a height of dx instead of h. Pi r squared dx from left to right. Add them up from left to right. Or as you'll see from low to high. Oh, the only reason I multiplied the previous one by 2 is because I use symmetry. Right. This one doesn't have y-axis symmetry. I'm just integrating from 0 to 1. If, if I was looking, if there was another part of a curve that went over here, and I was trying to go from negative 1 to 1, now I could use y-axis oh, symmetry. Okay. Two halves to make a whole. Right, 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 right. Very good. Yeah, okay. So I only use symmetry on that one because it had y-axis symmetry. This one has no y-axis symmetry. All right, let's go to another one. Perpendicular. That's the word of the day. Example three. Find the volume of the solid form by rotating the region bounded by this and that and that around the line y equals 1. Okay. Step one, identify the region. Identify the region. Y-axis, x-axis. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use... Uh, Let's see, what's a good color? How about orange that's cooked too long? There you go, burnt orange. Y equals 1. Burnt is spelt differently, so that's okay. Square root of x, yeah, it looks like that. And x equals 0 is this guy right here. It's the y-axis. So the region is this here. Now we do need to see where they intersect, okay? Let's go ahead and review. Let's find the area. If we were to find the area of the region... We would slice it vertically, and it would just be top curves minus bottom curve. From left to right, it would be 1 minus the square root of x. So we just need to figure out where they intersect. So off to the side, I'll just say intersect, and I'll set the equations equal. That's where the square root of x equals 1. You square both sides, and you get 1. Okay, sweet. So this is x equals 1. So the area should be the sum of the infinitely bent slices from left to right, from x equals 0 to x equals 1 of top minus bottom dx. So this is just the height, not the radius. So it's top minus bottom, which was 1 minus the square root of x. That would be your setup for the area. You're not squaring anything. That's a height times dx is the second dimension width. And that would be part A. And that one you could finish off by hand. x to the 1 half is a pretty easy one. But we're not doing that today. So we're not going to even finish that. So I'll just pull that off to the side. You go over there. Go over there. Okay, good. We're going to take this for a spin around the what? The line y equals 1. Okay, that's still a horizontal line, but notice it's no longer the x-axis. So if you imagine rotating that 360 degrees, if you want to see what it looks like, you can kind of reflect it across that line and then give it that old circular look to it. So it kind of looks like a sideways cone, except it's not a straight uh, surface. It's kind of curvy surface, so almost like a like a funnel that comes to a point instead of open. That's a worthless funnel. But maybe like a bowl that looks like a funnel. All right? So when you take a cross-section perpendicular to the axis of rotation, if this is a horizontal axis, if you were to slice it through vertically all the way through, you would see something that resembles a disk. And now our radius, we're going to measure it down below because that's where our equation is. See that? So here we go. The volume, V, is pi, the sum from 0 to 1. It's the same intervals of integration, R squared. So there's your pi R squared, and there's your thickness dx. Now for the radius, it's top minus bottom. One of them has to be the axis. In this case, the axis is on top. It's at Y equals 1 minus the curve is the square root of X. And again, if you notice, that happens to be the exact same thing as what we call the height. It's top minus bottom, top minus bottom. So if you want to draw your radius, you, you start on the axis. You might want to draw your radius. Always go to the axis first. Jose found something good. 
go to your axis and then draw a line to the curve. See that? You don't have a radius if you, ha if you don't have an axis. So go to the axis, draw a line to your curve. That's our R, and it's top minus bottom. So it's axis minus curve. It's 1 minus the square root of x. So that's what we're squaring. Now, once you get here, if this were a no calculator, you would actually have to FOIL it out to integrate it because pattern recognition doesn't work. But I'm not going to do that. Let's say if this were a calculated question, you would just type it in. Pi, don't forget pi, pi, math 9, type it in, hit enter, and you get the answer, 0 0.523 or 524. So for the rest of this section, I am not going to compute the actual answer. Because if you have to do it by hand or by the calculator, I'm going to assume that you know how to do it. Just don't forget the pi. Because if you forget the pi, and this were a multiple choice question, there will be an answer for you. Don't forget the pi. Life's too short. Eat dessert first. Pi, get out of the way, math 9. Pi, math 9. Okay, and the pi is there from the circle. Okay, sweet. Let's look at another one. Example 4. This is so much fun. Find the volume of the solid by rotating this region around the line called the y-axis. Okay, boss, you got it. Identify the region first. X cubed. I know what that looks like. That's the disco guy. That's going to be next Wednesday, by the way. Hippie day. Twins day Wednesday is hippie day. So dress like a hippie and try to match someone, and then you can be in the parade. So there's Y equals 8, and X equals 0. X equals 0 is the Y axis. So now we're looking at this region here. Okay. So to find the area, we would slice it vertically, right? Top minus bottom from left to right. Boom. No problem. You could also slice it horizontally if you wanted to, right? Low minus high, right minus left. That would work. We're not going to mess with that. We're rotating this now around the y-axis. Okay. That is a vertical axis. So if you were to reflect that across to see what it would look like, if you're curious and that kind of thing, it would look something like this. It would look kind of like a semicircle again, wouldn't it? Now, here's the deal. We only have one method at our disposal. If you slice this thing vertically from left to right, your cross sections are going to be all discombobulated. You're going to have, like, hemispheres. So because we rotated it around a vertical axis, in order to have cross sections that are circular or disc, we need to slice it how? Perpendicular. Yeah. So if you slice it all the way through perpendicular, to the axis of rotation. So let's say that was my representative slice. Notice now it's dy. And now what you end up with is still a disc, but because it's laying flat, it almost kind of looks like a platter. Okay? But if we can find the radius now as a function of y, all I got to do is add them up from low to high. Well, we know how to do that. The radius now is going to be right minus left instead of top minus bottom. One of them's got to be the equation of the curve, and one of them has got to be the axis. So let's go ahead and solve our equations for x, which we know we need to do for slicing horizontally. So if y equals x cubed, x equals the cube root of y. All right? And I think that's all we need. That's going to be this curve right here on the right. Um, I'm going to be slicing it from low to high. Do I have those intervals of integration already? Start slicing at y equals 0 all the way up to y equals 8. So I think I have it. I don't need to find the x value where they intersect, which would be 2, by the way. Pretty easy. Fine. So here we go. The volume. V for volume. What goes out front for the disk method? Pi times the sum from y equals 0 to y equals 8 of r squared dy. So, again, if you get in the habit of setting it up like that, you're going to be successful. Pi, r squared, and then the thickness, and then leave it blank. And then come back. Do the radius. It's right minus left. The curve on the right is the cube root of y. x equals the cube root of y. And the axis is on the left. It's x equals 0. So this will be the cube root of y minus 0. And you just earned yourself two checks. Sweet. Now, because we don't have time to start the next one, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and evaluate it. Let's say this was a non-calculated one. Part B. Part A would be to find the area. Part B would be something like this. If we simplify it, we get pi, the integral from 0 to 8, of y to the 2 thirds power, which again turns into a real easy one to integrate. 
So we got pi going along for the ride. Leave a space. Y to the two thirds becomes. You add one and get five thirds times the reciprocal three fifths. Right? Remember doing that. And then we evaluate it from zero to eight. The parentheses can go inside or outside. It doesn't really matter. The evaluation bar it doesn't really matter. I kind of go back and forth. Uh, but now the pi stays out front, and we plug it in. I'm going to pull the 3 fifths out front as well. Might as well do that. So we're going to have a 3 pi fifths, beefy bracket, 8 to the 5 thirds minus 0 to the 5 thirds. And if this were a free response, would you have to go any further than that? No. Do you all want to? I can see it in your eyes. I think I lost y'all at a half of a boiled egg. All right. Okay, I'm sorry. Eight to the five thirds. That's the same thing as the cube root of eight, which is two, and two to the fifth is thirty-two minus zero. So thirty-two times three is going to be ninety-six pi fifths, and that would be the answer. That would be the volume of that semicircular looking thing. It's not a perfect semisphere or hemisphere. Okay, it's got a cubic curve instead of a circular curve, but it looks very similar. Okay, it's probably going to be a little bit steeper, actually, but I know that its volume is 96 pi fifth. Okay, so the word of the day is perpendicular, right? When you slice a three-dimensional object perpendicular to the axis of rotation that created, your cross-sections are always circular disks. Pi r squared dx or pi r squared dy. Okay, Memorize that. Practice, practice. And what's the third one? Practice. Yeah, keep practicing until you get so bored because you're getting the right answer over and over and over again.